left you on a cliffhanger there yesterday. And remember how I said I didn't want this video to be 43 minutes long? Well, it's 45 minutes long. <laughs> Anyways, I, I think people enjoy watching some of the vehicle related stuff and whatnot, and I cut this down as much as I could, but hey, you know, to you people that want the longer content, here you go. We're gonna pick up right where we left off as I was driving the thing around, and when the check engine light turned on, and when it started running on seven cylinders instead of eight. Okay, so good news, bad news. I figured out what the squeaking is. It's the doghouse cover, so that's an easy fix. Um, bad news, I'm down one cylinder. So when I bought this thing, uh, the guy was like, oh yeah, and I replaced one of the ignition coils. Now on these vans, they have individual, individual ignition coils, one for each cylinder. And normally, uh, reduced power. Normally, when one ignition coil fails on these things, you want to replace them all. Because if one fails, the rest of them are all about to fail too. So I halfway expected this, actually, because he was like, oh yeah, I replaced one of them. And I was like, huh, okay. So in the back of my mind, I was like, all right, well, I'm gonna be buying seven or eight ignition coils. I'm sure it'll be obvious which one was replaced, but about 90,000 miles is when they tend to go. So just kind of interesting. We got the check engine light now. I'm gonna pull the codes when we get back, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna be cylinder X number misfire. Uh, but yeah, we'll find out here in a little bit. So it's really bad for the catalytic converter to run with a cylinder down because you're basically getting raw fuel into there. You can actually hear it down there, cooling down, hear all that ticking. That is not rain. That is a superheated cat cooling down. <laughs> and it definitely smells hot. Uh, thing to remember though, oh, is my code scanner all the way back there? Oh, there it is. Um, thing to remember though, if you uh, have a misfire, if your check engine light starts flashing, back off the throttle. Because the O2 sensors do have some temperature sensing capabilities. And if that light is flashing rapidly when you have your foot in the throttle, that means conditions exist that your vehicle is potentially able to catch fire. Um, so if you ever do see that when you're driving, let off the throttle. I was driving nice and easy because I knew exactly what was going on here. But um, yeah, let's see if we can, ah, that's cold. Can't touch cold things. Um, where's my grabber stick? Oh, here it is. This is the extra super extendo one. Ugh, that's good for things. Okay. Let's have a look and see what is going on. Our OBD2 cable. I think it's the yellow one. Yeah. And then I had to move or relocate the DLC port or the OBD2 port um, because it was mounted to part of the dashboard that hasn't yet been reinstalled. So it's on this little pigtail here. All right, there we go. Turn the key to the on position. Turn off our blower motor. Plug this heifer in and see what we get here. Let's see, config, Ford. Oh, I need to update this thing. It only goes to 2007 currently. I need to get some new firmware on this. All right, 2002, scan. Okay, three diagnostic codes. Let's see what we got here. Data, triple codes, triple codes. Ignition coil, ground primary, secondary circuit malfunction. So, um, that could be a wiring issue, but typically a ground fault means that the coil is bad. Let's see what else we have here. Well, we only have that one. Let's see what pending codes we have. Misfire detected on startup. First 1,000 revolutions. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, I'm gonna turn this up. Actually, I'm gonna look at the data stream real quick. Oxygen sensor, eight volts. Yeah, we're running rich. 
Okay, so oxygen sensor on bank one is super rich. Oxygen sensor on bank two is super lean. So now we know which side of the engine it's on. It's bank one. We've had the diagnostic codes for two miles. Okay, I'm gonna shut this thing off. I wanna run it any longer than I have to with a misfire like that, but yeah, so I know exactly what that is. It's easy to fix. Um, like, that's the nice thing with vans, especially these Ford ones. The engine, hang on. Come off of there. Urgh. The engine is basically inside the van. So I can just sit here in my chair and and do all the work on this thing. Um, this giant glove box thing comes off, but then the doghouse comes off. I've taken that off anyways because it's squeaking like crazy. Um, and then everything's right there. It's not like my old Power Stroke diesel van. Um, that one, to get the valve covers off, you had to pull the engine. Or in the case of cutaway chassis like ambulances and whatnot, uh, they would take the body off the frame. So <laughs> something to pull the valve covers and inspect your injectors, normally free at some places, suddenly becomes 21 hours of labor. But luckily, this thing's gasoline. It's not that big, so shouldn't be too big a deal. But anyways, um, someone gave me a pizza. So I'm gonna scrape the cheese off of that and eat it, throw the crust away, watch some TV, and then we'll deal with this in the morning. Probably just take a lift or something over to the auto parts store. Um, I don't wanna drive this because I don't wanna replace the catalytic converter. <laughs> parts. Welcome to winter, apparently. It's uh, almost 3.30. It's already starting to get dark outside. Oh, I guess I need the remote for the van. Um, we're gonna go out real quick and pop the engine cover on the van and take a look at the spark plug coil situation. I went ahead and just ordered the parts that I that I need. Um, actually, uh, well, I'm assuming the coils are going to need replacing. If one of them failed and the previous owner did one, I'm pretty sure the rest are about to go. But I'm going to pull the engine cover right now. I've ordered them for pickup at an auto parts place, and a lift is on the way to pick me up and take me there and bring me back. So before they get here, we're going to pull the cover and at least take a look under there. Yep, hail. Why is it every time I get near this van it starts hailing? Like seriously. Well, all that water is gonna get in here, that's nice. A freaking A. Okay, we're gonna close the door for a minute. It's time to work on this van. It's hailing every single time. Luckily when it does hail around here, it doesn't usually last very long. It'll blow through in like five minutes at the most, it'll be done. Actually, it sounds like it's lighting up now. Okay, well I gotta get my stuff ready. I'm gonna get wet, but I don't care. Let's go inside. Mmm, hail. At least it's water that you can just, that you can just brush off yourself. <laughs> Are you kidding? It let up. Oh, uh, well, so case in point, I have to raise the lift up and then I can close it all remotely. So let me grab the umbrella. This is the one problem with not having all of the functions remote control, but not too big a deal. So I just have to use this switch run the lift up to floor height and then I can get back out of the rain and do the rest from remote. 
assuming I can reach the button. Okay, there we go. Okay, now, I'm just trying to remember which buttons it is. I think it's this one. And then this one. All right, there we go. Okay, we have assorted parts now. After a little bit more poking around, I realized that our cylinder numbering uh, starts on the right bank and goes sequentially back. So one, two, three, four, back to the front, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, I need to grab my code scanner. I didn't look at the actual code last night. The last digit in the code tells you which cylinder is. I looked at the footage. I waved it in front of the camera for a split second, and I think it was seven. And that's the coil pack that's been replaced in here. So it's interesting that that one blew again. That actually tells me that we probably also need to replace the spark plugs, or there's a bad electrical connector. The, a few minutes ago when I looked in here, the connectors looked okay, but one thing that will take out these coil packs over and over and over again is spark plugs that are gapped too wide. So, since we're at 90,000 miles, and I'm assuming this is all OE, OEM stuff in here, I went ahead and bought $60 worth of Bosch Iridium, double Iridium spark plugs. Um, the double Iridium was probably a bit overkill. I think single Iridium probably would have been fine. But, actually, are these reverse firing? I don't think they are. Anyways, these are good for like another 100,000 miles. I got a box of eight coil packs. It, buying all of them like this, they worked out to about $27 each. So, eh. And uh, as you can see here, oh, this is actually different than the one that's in there. Um, Duralast. Well, at least I know the spark plugs will be good by the time we're done. And uh, at least have the boot and everything built in. But since we're dealing with aluminum heads, and some Ford products love to spit spark plugs out of the thread holes. I went ahead and got, well, you should do it anyways, always, no matter what, never sees. Always put those on the threads. And then the other thing that, see these coils, like they're small and they don't like any extra resistance or any extra workload whatsoever. So I also got dielectric grease and I'm gonna fill each spark plug boot with that. This stuff is interesting. It's actually a conductor and an insulator. So this will basically make sure that the spark's not jumping where it's not supposed to, and things that are in physical contact that has this on it makes a very good conductor. So that's gonna help us out there as well. So I think we've got everything we need here. Uh, Mitchell Manual rates this at 5.8 hours. Um, that seems a little excessive to me. The front ones might be kind of hard to reach, but I'm gonna start with cylinder seven and pull that thing out of there and see what our gap looks like. And uh, I'm assuming the plugs are just gapped, are worn out, thus the gap is kind of insane. So, um, I got this a long time ago for safety purposes. This is 860 lumens of uh, Cree LED, but it comes in super handy for stuff like this. And you can also dim it. So you can change the brightness of this thing as well, which is kind of nice, but works really good for this type of job. Um, I'm going to grab the code scanner again, though, and double check that code uh, just to verify um, stuff and or things. So let me grab that real quick. Now, this particular code scanner, for whatever reason, will not pull codes unless the engine is running. Typically, your good OBD2 scan tools are not going to care as long as the key is turned on. But I am also very curious, very curious to see if we still have that misfire. Uh, now that the thing has sat overnight and cooled back down, um, because it started off kind of random and then it turned into a hard miss. Um, so let's go ahead and fire this thing up and see what we get. Yep, still missing. Ooh, belt squeak. Actually. So it's not missing, but we've got a really rough idle. Well, it doesn't show up on camera, but the engine's vibrating a little bit. If we look right down here by the head. Well, I can see it in person, but um, it's hard to see on camera. Yeah, it's like a half a miss. 
Okay, let's pull our data here again. And we've got three codes. So we'll go down into our treble codes. Yep, 3057, that's still under number seven. Which is the secondary circuit malfunction. Uh, I was gonna look at our pending codes here. Yeah, and then misfire detected on startup, which makes sense. So, um, yeah, so now that I can actually <laughs> weird noises, <laughs> um, but now that I can actually see the engine, um, I kind of, I couldn't tell before if it was running rough, but it's just not as smooth of an idle as it should be. So I'm pretty sure that our spark plugs are worn out of spec. So um, I'm going to sit on the passenger seat um, raised floor thing and uh, we'll get to work. I'll check back in when I have an update. Okay, see that gray thing right there? That's cylinder seven. That is the, um, the coil pack that's been replaced. This one here, which you can't see, is black and the rest of them are black. So, something going on with that one in particular. I might not have to do any of this. Um, look, the, the, see, the, I wanted to take this apart and look at it first, but I also want to get the parts and get started before it was dark outside. Um, but uh, I can always return the parts, but check this out. This is the electrical connector right here for that coil pack. Look at this. Watch, watch. It wasn't plugged in! <laughs> uh, okay. Oh yeah. It's running smooth now. <laughs> oh my goodness. I've never been so happy to... I'm trying to figure out what that noise is. I've never been so happy to find an electrical connector that was not plugged in all the way. Yeah. I don't think I'm gonna waste my time with any of this. Um, this begs a question now. Um, I mean, it is good to have known good spark plugs, but I was basing the fact that they were worn out on the fact that that coil pack had failed again. This is always why you verify things first, but like I said, I wanted to take a lift out there while it was still light outside, so I just ordered the parts and figured I could return them later. Um, but I don't think there's a reason for me to do anything right now. Um, I did want to look around under the hood. I want to, um, I want to check on a few things since this has rear heat and whatnot. They usually bundle things together with zip ties, and I wanted to ver see like this right here. This needs to be attached to something. This right here has clearly been rubbing on the engine cover. That's one of our rear heater hose lines. And there's like electrical tape around this for some reason. So normally whenever I get a vehicle, I like to go through it and just sort of inspect all that stuff. Um, ooh, we could do an EGR block off. Hmm. Although we do still have a catalytic converter on this thing. And that would result in the check engine light being on all the time. I'll probably just leave it for now. And then you can see right here too, we've got some wear from this hose on top of the, uh, is it the IAC? Uh, yeah, that looks like the idle air control. So I just want to reroute some things, add some zip ties, double check all the wiring, make sure, I mean, here you can see we've had a lot of abrasion right here. So I just like to go through all this stuff, check everything out, make sure we're good. That way you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's friggin' awesome, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna clear these codes, let it idle for a little while, and uh, look at the data stream, and I think we should be good. So, here's an example of exactly why I do this sort of thing, especially with a van that has dropped floors. Check out this O2 sensor wire right here. It's not frayed all the way through, but you can see it was definitely rubbing on this floor drop. 
So that needs to be addressed. Um, it's not a problem right now, but it very quickly will be. So that's gonna get some electrical tape and a zip tie. I'm gonna clean this up a little bit, use a different zip tie on there. These fuel lines are heat wrapped. Everything looks pretty good going down into the floor there, so that's good. Um, I'm gonna find something to mount this wire on, probably the transmission dipstick tube here. Uh, but yeah, there's just, like I said, a number of things that's good to look around on these vehicles when you first get them. And uh, there's our air filter up there. You can see that. There you go. Um, yeah, it's always good to check this stuff out. There's our steering shaft. You can see that. There we go. There's our steering shaft. Oh, looks like it's got a Zerk fitting on it. That's cool. I know it's blurry, but uh, it's nice to see. Oh, that's not a Zerk fitting. That's a bolt. But anyways. Yeah, so I did get the hand controls in here. I haven't reinstalled the lower part of the dash. I'm going to have to do some modifications on that. But um, yeah, they, they seem to work for now. We've got our brakes, throttle. And uh, yeah, once again, once it's daylight, I'll go over this stuff. But yeah, for now, I'm just gonna work on this for a little bit, put it all back together, then uh, probably go for a little drive and stuff. Got my uh, good zip ties here. I was noticing that the, this is our, these are our fuel lines right here. And I was kind of noticing that this heat wrap around them is starting to get a little bit of abrasions on this floor here. And same with these, eh, sorry, it's hard to film this. Same with these uh, heater hoses here. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put a little piece of plastic on there so that that's actually rubbing on the metal. Zip tie it around this, that way these things have something to ride on. This is actually the gas pedal out of the old van. Um, and then I've got this other piece of plastic from the overhead console. I think what I might do is cut this in half and stick it on top of these bundles down here and zip tie it around. That way that metal surface is riding on this thing as opposed to the actual heat shielding, which will eventually saw through. Because, I mean, motor mounts are not solid. They have some give to them so that you don't get engine vibration. And seeing as how vans have tight clearance, things are gonna vibrate a little bit, and we don't need to be sawing holes in our vapor recovery, fuel lines, heater hoses, all that good stuff. Um, yeah, so that thing's still coming in handy. While we're in here screwing around, I'm going to check a few other of the uh, common failure points on these Ford modular engines. And uh, one of them is has to do with the EGR system, which this is your main EGR valve right here. And this tube comes up from your exhaust, which you can see. See over here, that comes up, tees in and pipes into your intake right here. That's sort of for an emissions thing. You can block it off to get a little bit better performance and mileage. Um, but we're gonna leave it hooked up for right now. But the thing that always fails on these is right here. Uh, this is a flow sensor. So basically hot exhaust gases, if we look back down here, the uh, there's our exhaust manifold. You can see it peeking through, that's that rusty thing. And then we have these two lines right here that come up with these rubber hoses connected. And those plug into, see so if we can get the light here, I think you can kind of see. So we've got these two hoses right here and they come up and connect to this blurry thing. <laughs> they connect to this thing right here. And what this does is in that pipe down there, there's a little orifice that creates a pressure change. And we've got one pipe on one side of the orifice and one pipe on the other. And then this module right here measures the dif pressure differential between the two to confirm that this valve right here is actually opening and there is flow of EGR gas. But as you notice, this thing is made of plastic and there's hot exhaust gas going through those two, going through those hoses up into here. So these things will tend to melt. As you can see, this one isn't melted. It appears to be in good shape. So that's fine there. Um, we don't seem to have any hole, holes in the EGR line. We've got our uh, heat shielding down on the intake here. That seems to be intact. Oh, and as you can see, I've added a few zip ties <laughs> in various places. Um, and we've also got our piece of plastic installed down here uh, to insulate our fuel lines. I bent this fuel bracket up a ways and I stuck a bolt in the head right here, wrapped it with electrical tape, and I'm using that. And I'm using that to get these rear heater lines pulled away from the fuel lines and away from the body right here, because this was rubbing. And then we've got these things all connected together, so they're not going to be rubbing. Basically anything anywhere that was touching something else, 
uh, I just went ahead and put a zip tie on there. That way they're not rubbing. They're actually in contact and we should be good. But yeah, um, oh yeah, we got our O2 connector fastened up out of the way here. And the wires route around the side of the tranny cooler line, so no problems there. This isn't rubbing anymore. So yeah, I think we should be pretty good to go here. Um, I'm gonna fit this doghouse back on here and uh, check and see. There was one part that was squeaking, so I think the weather stripping might be a little screwy, but uh, yeah, almost done. So these vans, however, do make it very easy to get to the radio wiring. All you do is pull up the doghouse, and then as you can see, all of your radio wiring is right here. Um, so that does make that a little bit easier. Okay, so now we're going to inspect our engine cover. Um, just make sure all of our weather stripping and stuff is intact, which it seems to be. And a lot of times the source of squeaking on these things can be these little clips right here. There's one on each side. So they basically slide in and hook right here. But you can see there's a bit of abrasion there on both sides. So what I like to do with these that helps a bit, um, not that I've ever done squeak and rattle work for Ford, but basically just wrap these with electrical tape. Uh, so I got some down there. And you wanna wrap it in a direction. I'm gonna start from the bottom and go up. That way as you push the tape on, it's not gonna bunch it up. But yeah, just a few wraps around there will uh, help keep these things from squeaking against the body a little bit. Dealt with a lot of these things when they're in conversion vans. Um, people are picky with these things. Okay, now a little trick with these things when you're putting the engine cover back on. Um, I like to do it with the engine running because sometimes it's hard to tell when you have everything sealed correctly and everything is in the place where it's supposed to be. So if your engine's running, you can actually hear the air gaps and tell when uh, you've actually got everything sealed properly. It's super apparent on the diesels as well. Um, the ones on diesels are way thicker than this. But basically you just wanna make sure any extra wires you have up top here by the radio are out of the way. And then you wanna grab these handles and make sure they're pointing backwards like that. I like to actually lift with both of these, one on each side. Basically just set the thing up in here like that. Look at your top corners to make sure you're aligned and then just sort of push it into place. And there we go, you can hear it's nice and quiet. If I back this off a tiny bit, so you can hear engine noise. But when it's perfectly sealed, you'll know. Um, I'm gonna get these things tightened up. Uh, the, the glove box sort of attaches to these. Um, so I'm gonna get these things fixed and I'll be back. All right, there we go. Everything's back together. I'm gonna get all the tools and garbage and stuff cleaned up out of here. And uh, actually, what time is it? That's only 6.15. I might see when the parts store closes. I don't think there's a reason to keep $300 worth of stuff for this van lying around. Um, yeah, so I'm probably gonna try and take that stuff back tonight. Okay, so all the stuff you just saw about the engine misfire and the coil and all that stuff being fixed, that happened after I got the wireless remote set up the rest of the way to partially control the lift and the power doors. Now the power doors we saw in yesterday's video, but as far as deploying the lift, I filmed a bunch of stuff with that, but I was using a couple of LED lights, the one on my head and then also this little lantern thing I have. And as it turns out, to save energy, those things flicker. And it created this crazy banding on the screen. The footage is almost unwatchable, and I mean, while I am photosensitive, it's not incredibly bad, but it's also not good. So I'm not gonna show that. Essentially, the thought process was that lift is only temporary in the van right now. I'm gonna be swapping it out for one with a longer platform that has a higher weight lifting capacity rating because right now, this Q6 Edge 1 is the only chair I can fit in there that I have. The Steampunk chair would work, but I haven't fixed that yet. My new Quantum won't fit in there. The F3 won't fit in there. and while the Bounder might, it's about 210 pounds over the weight limit of that lift. So, all that being said, I decided to go ahead and partially remote control the lift. Like you saw yesterday, you can hit a couple buttons to open and close the doors, and then to deploy and stow the lift, you have these two buttons here. And it was easy enough for me to just make it stow and deploy, and I explained why I did that. 
but I would have to get like a four channel wireless module, but then the doors would have to be integrated as well. I could get it all set up on like two buttons, but like I said, there's no reason to spend all the time doing that. And I'll show you a couple of clips here of what the inside of the current lift mechanism looks like. It's a little bit of a rat's nest. Um, so just in the interest of not wasting a bunch of time and energy on something that's gonna be taken out probably within the next month or so, uh, we just did it this way. But anyhow, here's a few clips of that, just a couple of highlights and to show you what the inside of the, uh, the lift control box looks like that's currently mounted in the van. Okay, well, for some reason, it always seems to be the middle of the night when I'm doing this stuff and I leave the camera inside. But anyways, I've wired up the power doors to one of these wireless modules. Buttons A and B are open and close. What I'm gonna do now, or attempt to do now, is since the power doors are completely independent of this lift that's in here, I'm gonna try and wire up C and D buttons here with a secondary wireless module to handle stow and deploy. Right now, this is the only way to control the lift. So I have to pull the wire in and out and do all that obnoxious stuff. It'll make it a little bit faster when I'm outside in the rain because I can open the doors and deploy the lift, but it can't go down all the way. I should be able to leave this thing in here on the wall and then just reach up and hit the switch on the side of the lift and that'll work for now. I was doing some checking earlier today and I don't think any of my chairs except for this one and potentially the steampunk chair when I get that repaired will fit on this lift. So this thing's probably gonna get swapped out sooner than later. But for right now, I'm going to check out the wiring on this remote where it plugs in down here and see if there's an easy way to add in this extra dual channel control box and uh, see if we can get a little bit more control of this thing. I'm realizing now that underneath this cover is a little bit of a rat's nest. As you can see down in there, that's where our hand control plugs in. And uh, the control board is also down there, which is one of these things. Um, so we've got some random schematics here. But this thing's, yeah, it's kind of a mess. I'll just see if I can figure, find another output. I think typically what they do on these things is they just put a Y cable on this output right here and then uh, they use that to wire into the vehicle. So I'm gonna see if I can figure out what the schematics are, potentially take this thing apart and figure out uh, the wiring for that. Cross-referencing between these two schematics, this one is labeled with colors but not functions. This one is labeled with functions but not colors. And they seem to be pretty much the same. So what I've done, I've taken the screws out of this bracket right here so I can unplug this connector now. There we go. And um, this connects to the hand control here. And I think what I'm gonna do is strip back some of this wire and then just uh, access the, sorry about that flickering light there. Um, and then I'm gonna access the, um, the wiring that I need in here and just add some jumpers to this, tape it all back up and plug it in. So we'll just have some extra wire sticking off the side of this thing basically. According to the schematics here, We've got two black wires. One of them's ground, and the other one is what activates the uh, deploy function. So I've peeled back um, the sheathing on this wire here for the hand control, and I need to verify that the colors in this remote wire are the same as what's in that lift. And it's looking like to me there's a lot more wires in here than there are functions or are on the schematic. And I'm only seeing one black wire. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this thing apart, look at the wiring in here, and then I can verify the colors on this thing and figure out which pins go to where on here. Then we can see if the colors are the same or if I need to modify anything. Um, yeah, We've got the screws out of our hand control here. Oh, um. So let's see if we can pull this board a little bit further out of here and ascertain what our white wire is supposedly doing. Now, this is a really simple board. I'm assuming white is actually brown. So brown, which is pin three. Uh, let's see, one, two, three. One, two, three, goes over here. Okay, so 
brown is white. Excellent. Oh boy, this is getting complicated. Yeah, so pin two is what orange would be on this. Okay, we figured it out. Um, black is deploy, orange is stow, red is power. Um, so we should be able to just, uh, where did I cut that? We're gonna add some jumper wires here and then uh, black, orange, and red are basically what we need. And then I'll have to run a fourth wire from this to ground. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, I think this should do something. And when the door is closed, the lift's actually disabled, which works in our favor. So if I accidentally hit one of these buttons for deploying the lift while the door is closed, it won't work because this box will not be powered up. Okay, we got it. Time for some wiring. Okay, we're ready to wire this into the control box. What I've done here, is besides make a mess, um, I cut our, it was orange, black, and red wires on our hand control here that plugs into the lift. And I've bundled the rest of the wires up because they're bypassing this whole mess. And there's screw terminals in here. So, I'm trying to shadow my camera. Um, there's screw terminals in here. So this is gonna be a junction box as well as injecting signals as needed into these wires. So. Okay, we've come to a critical part in our journey here where it started raining and I need to get out and move some stuff. I'm wired up here, but I also need to get out and get a zip tie. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just for the moment being, I'm gonna use this electrical tape to sort of keep these wires from coming off of here just enough so that I can plug this remote back in and get out of the van. Because right now the lift doesn't work because I just took it apart. Um, I should be able to plug this remote back in and it should work in theory. Um, we don't have a ground wire yet, so I can't use the actual wireless remote. Oh, and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I should probably put this back together so it works because kind of need this uh, to be able to get out of the van as well. I guess that's one of the dangers of doing stuff like this is you could very easily potentially get yourself stuck in this vehicle if you screw up the wiring and whatnot. Okay, we're good. I'm gonna hop out, I'll be right back. So I'm gonna go over our wiring here. Basically, what we've got going on is uh, we've got three wires that have been stripped out of this hand control and we've put this wireless module between the hand control and where it plugs into the lift and we've got power coming in and the way this hand control works is there's a power wire going through it and when you hit a button it shorts that power wire to one of four other wires in here for different functions. So we pulled that through, we're using that 12 volts to power this module which is fine, it doesn't use that much power and then we're taking that power, which is also gonna be used for switching. We bumped it over to common on both of these dry relays. So yellow wire there, yellow wire there. And we've connected the two functions that we want, which is stow and deploy, up to these headers here on the normally open circuit. Now with relays, normally open and normally closed refers to the state of the relay contact when there's no power applied to it. So normally open means when it's just sitting here, it's not, it's not doing anything. When you hit the switch and it's powered up, then it goes closed. But yeah, so normally open on both of those. But since we had to cut this wire in half, we're also using this screw terminal to join the two halves of that wire back together so that this thing will still work. So I believe we are ready to test this thing. And I wanna put the lid on the box. A lot of this stuff in this lift is only temporary. So this thing is just gonna be living on the floor down here. And I wanna make sure if someone trips on it or something happens, it's not going to rip the wires out of this and put the lift into crazy, let's just keep deploying, doing things mode. There are a lot of safety lockouts on this lift, so I'm not too worried about that. Um, whenever it gets to the end of travel, it will stop, but I'm kind of OCD when it comes to wiring and making sure there's mechanical protection or mitigation for strain relief. Okay. So I think that should be all right. And then we'll just put one more zip tie on here and call it a day. And these are not solid core wire, so you can't actually bend them around like this without fear of them breaking internally. Okay, there we go. 
that's uh, good and sturdy. It's not going anywhere. Uh, let me go ahead and get this antenna rerouted back out here. I believe the data sheet on this said that you don't want to route the antenna past the actual clock module. So I'm going to push it out the other hole here on the other side of this box. But these little units, if I remember, I'll link them down on Amazon or just comment if I forget and I will uh, put a link to these. They're like 12 or 13 bucks and they have like an insane like thousand yard range or something. They're 433 megahertz and these are awesome. This is exactly what I was using, the same type of system on the green van. The old green van that tried to kill me um, as the uh, power door control system. And it worked flawlessly for the year or so that I had it on there. Hmm. Okay, so, oh, I guess now that I've tied all that up, I still need to run a ground wire. <laughs> uh, that's always something. I can only find this yellow wire, so we're going to... I'm gonna pull off a length of this and then probably just pick up one of these bolts or something here and use that as a ground. I thought about driving a text screw through something, but there's uh, there's enough random bolts here. Um, I can just use a ring terminal. And now we have a yellow ground wire that's the same color as our power jumper. <laughs> Convenient. But nothing else yellow comes out of this box, so I think that should be fine. Yeah, so projects like this, sometimes I just kind of get in the zone and I start doing stuff and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to film that, I just want to get it done. But then I realize, like, it's not that much work to just go grab the camera and uh, show you guys what I'm doing. So I think a lot of this is sort of interesting. Slash, I don't think there's other people <laughs> that are really doing the same type of thing. Like, working on their own wheelchair vans and stuff. And even if it doesn't make any sense what I'm doing, people still tell me they <laughs> like to watch anyways. So, yeah, whatever. Okay, so here we go. Finished product. Um, oh, before I put the lid on, we need to do the programming for the remote. Okay, so I just realized something. Apparently you can program um, two buttons on the same function on these remotes at once. So I had to completely clear all of the stored codes in this thing because it was running the pump while it was deploying. It's only supposed to run the pump while it's going up. Oh, I switched the buttons. So going up and then going down, it shouldn't be running at all. Okay, so I'm gonna have to race them again and do it again to get it right, but that's why it was behaving strangely. At least we figured it out now. Okay, let's go drive this thing. Got the hand controls in. I don't have an easy lock yet. It's a little bit tricky to reach behind me and attach straps, but it is doable. Um, but yeah, this thing, yeah, I drove around earlier today. Uh, I, I really like it. <laughs> Guess what? There is gonna be a part three, and it's gonna be about the hand controls. Because I'm realizing now, the way this van is, it's got a lot of torque. It's kind of a weird motor. It's got cams installed in it that sort of makes it better for towing and makes the torque. Well, so the motor's got around 310 horsepower, but 390 foot pounds of torque. And the peak torque is at like 2,800 RPM and peak horsepower, I think is 4,200 or 4,300. So it's a really strange motor. I mean, it's really good and it's strong, but you have no high-end power. Everything is on the bottom end that would be good for towing and getting moving from a stop and whatnot. As a result of that, the hand controls are very sensitive and all of the driving is done between zero and 10% throttle. So I had to get new tires on the back. I drove it around a couple times in the rain and those little tiny tires, they were just constantly spinning. So I decided to get some bigger tires for the back of it. It was not incredibly cheap. The pair of tires was like $565, but they have a, they, the, well, the scrap for the old van uh, paid for that at least, but um, they have a 60,000 mile uh, warranty on them. And these vans are a little bit hard on tires. You have to rotate them and rotating them is gonna be tricky because there's different sizes on the front and the back, but Anyways, for now it's gonna be good. I can rotate them left or right because the tires are not directional. But anyways, all that being said, after driving this thing around with the hand controls, I'm gonna to have to switch 
hand controls to the other ones that I have. Right now the ones I have are right angle. You push down for brakes, or you push forward for brakes and down for acceleration. The other style that I have that I'm gonna put on there is what they call a push rock. And you have a vertical handle that you hold on to instead of a horizontal one. And you, same thing, you push down for brakes, but for accelerating, you rock the thing towards you. And it's a lot easier to be a lot more precise. And the handle's about yay tall. So you can kind of adjust like how sensitive or how much you want to, um, <laughs> you, you can adjust how uh, much pressure you want to put on the gas pedal by grabbing that lever higher or lower as you turn it. But that's going to be the next video. Uh, I haven't filmed any of that yet. I'm going to show the differences between the two. And then I figure before I get rid of the white van, I might as well show how UVO lifts work and why they suck so bad. Um, they are so prone to getting stuck and that'll be a completely separate video, but I'm going to show that as well. Anyways, yeah, so back to whatever's going on now. There will be a part three, but uh, it'll probably be in the next couple of days. It's raining a lot and I gotta wait for that to quit. But anyhow, um, yeah, back to whatever's going on now. <laughs>